Jim, for that nice introduction. Thanks for inviting me, you, Rick, and Pat, which I appreciate. And thanks to Kim, Judy, and Gloria for joining me today. I'm tickled that they are with us as guests. Well, I'm going to start to tell you just what I have. Jim asked me to speak for about 25 minutes, so I have a 25-minute presentation in mind. Um, I'll be talking about some background to both Sudan and South Sudan, which are neighboring countries, of course. Um, I'll be giving you uh, photographs from my travels there to show you what life is like in that area. And near the end of my presentation today, I'll talk about Project Education South Sudan, which our friend Jim, of course, has been touting appropriately to the Golden Club. I've been touting it to other clubs. And we'll talk at the very end about the value of working with the young girls through that initiative. So that will be at the very end. Well, I'm gonna start, of course, I have some pictures that'll come online, but I'm gonna start with a bit of show and tell. And later today, I'm gonna to end with show and tell. See this guy? I think you can see him. He's a fellow I met in Sudan, rather noble looking guy, I think you'd agree. When you work in Sudan and South Sudan, he happened to be a Sheikh, a tribal chieftain. You have to work with tribal chieftains and respect their power, understand how they operate in a tribal dynamic and wrestle with some of those issues. You don't simply go to the governmental center and start operating or go to an NGO and start operating. It doesn't work that way in Sudan and South Sudan. Well, here are some of the headlines I've grabbed just in the last month online from various newspapers, from various news sources. I'm just gonna read these somewhat randomly. They're all within the last month or so to show you the challenges of working in Sudan and South Sudan. Here's the headline. COVID-19 and violence spreading in South Sudan, a UN envoy, David Shearer, warns. With only 10,000 tests conducted in a total population of 12 million in South Sudan vis-a-vis -vis COVID. Only 10,000 tests, 12 million people. Here's another headline that came out recently. It's a more positive headline. UNICEF reconfirms its support to the government of South Sudan as 1,400 schools, public schools, prepare to reopen. Here's a negative headline. Over to Sudan. Sudan's Prime Minister, Abdallah Hamduk, calls for international aid as transition teeters and amid an economic collapse. Here's another headline. The United Nations Special Envoy to South Sudan on Tuesday said, almost no progress has been made in unifying the country's warring forces under one army, as promised under a hard fought peace deal. And here's the last headline to read. Thousands of Sudanese people are still suffering from the aftermath of the unsurpassed floods and rains and the expected dangers related to deteriorated health conditions. So my friends, if that sounds like a litany with one exception of sad and chaotic headlines, that is correct. And that is the challenge of working in South Sudan and Sudan neighboring countries today. So I'm going to uh, give you just a little uh, background, a historic, very brief historic background, and show you some pictures which lay the land. Um, colonial rule was important in that area dating to the 1800s. Egypt was also powerful, no surprise. Sudan gained independence in 1956. From 1972 to 1983, Southern Sudanese, even though they were still part of Sudan, began a civil war, which went on and on. In 2005, 
a comprehensive peace accord was signed. I met the gentleman who, by the way, helped draft that comprehensive accord, a very nice man named Roger Winter. In 2011, which is when I was there in South Sudan, that country became independent. It's the country, it's one of the two newest independent countries in the world, dating to 2011. But in 2013, a new civil war erupted in that area, engaging in various ways, both Sudan and South Sudan. And that disruption continues today and was reflected in the headlines I read to you a few minutes ago. During this recent period, some of the disruption is around oil, which is South Sudan's number one exportable resource, around China and its intervention in Sudan and South Sudan and its need for their oil. And there's much disruption and I could go into the details, but it's been both successful in bringing in export dollars, import dollars, and it's been disastrous in terms of disrupting the lives of everyday people there. Well, I'm now gonna go to uh, screen share and I'll see if I can uh, make this work right. Give me a second. Give me another second. I think we're getting close there. So Sudan and South Sudan are desolate places but I wanna show you just a variety of photos about everyday people and everyday life because it's not all negative, it's not all chaotic. Lots of good things happen. And so these photos are more positive than negative. I rode on that bus next to a peanut salesman. Well, that was pretty cool. And I was invited to attend a wedding there's the husband catching his wife with glee at the wedding ceremony. It was midnight. The ladies at the ceremony invited me to dance. They're doing the bird dance. I tried my very best to do the bird dance with them. They couldn't contain their laughter though at the way I dance. Water resources, as Jim mentioned in his introduction are important to me and certainly to folks there. And there are a wide variety of water sources used from tanks, wells, ponds. Cattle often foul the water sources, as you see here, the cattle of nomads, and that's problematic, of course. They have a modest healthcare system. Here's a clinician interviewing a boy who's coming in for treatment. And of course the markets. I've always told my students before I retired at the University of Denver, if you wanna find out about a place, an overseas place, first start in the market. That's the greatest way to start to meet people, to get colorful photos and to get some of the action. Charcoal is a major source of fuel, but also a compounding problem because of the trees that are taken down to produce the charcoal. Here's another fellow, not as important as the previous fellow I showed you, but nonetheless, another nice fellow that I met. And here's two more nice fellows that I met. Like any other country, sports are important. Soccer, no surprise, is a big deal in both Sudan and South Sudan. There's folks at the soccer game. There's the soccer team. And both Christianity and Islam are important, very important in these areas. Islam more so in Sudan, Christianity more so in South Sudan. Sorghum is a tremendously important crop. And the most recent sad news 
is that an infestation of locusts, you may have heard about it, it's one of the biggest infestations to hit the Horn of Africa in recent decades, came in and particularly in South Sudan, decimated the sorghum crop, causing further distress for people dependent on sorghum as one of their main foods. We were working in a small village. The villagers thanked us for the water resource work we were doing and said, we wanna thank you, but we don't have any money. We said, well, that's fine, that's fine. They said, well, we insist, we're going to give you a sheep. We said, well, that's very nice. Um, we were just driving in our two Land Rovers. We were heading to the next village. So we had to strap the poor sheep bleeding alive to the top of our Land Rover until we could get there later in the evening to the next village where our cook slaughtered it and we ate the poor thing that same evening. That's what really happens in places like this. That's how you survive. There we are, we're eating. And we do meet government officials in the work we do. Here are several government officials. This is in the uh, Darfur area of Western Sudan. And indeed, you must deal with officials certainly, but like most Rotarians, we, we really wanna work at the grassroots and we try to focus on the everyday folks, particularly through NGOs, through Rotary, and through other on the ground units. And I'll end with that iconic photo of a jebel. A jebel is a mountain in that area. It's really quite a landscape, as you can see. So with those photos in mind, and you got a sense of the environment and the people, um, I wanted to say those positive things because now I have to say a whole bunch of negative things. <laughs> if there was a problem that you could think of in the world, either Sudan or South Sudan in particular are confronting those problems right now. The environments are chaotic. Let me give you a, a laundry list. I don't really believe in laundry lists, but in, in this case, since time is short, I'm going to give you a list of the problems in that area. Ethnic conflict and tribalism. Food insecurity. Corruption at virtually all levels of government. Environmental degradation, also associated with those oil pro problems I mentioned earlier. Water quality and access. You saw a couple of photos related to water quality issues. Literacy, and we're gonna get back to literacy in a few moments when we get to Project Education South Sudan. Many youngsters and oldsters don't have any schools at all that they can access. And as an aside, in the work we've done over the years with many colleagues, not just in Sudan and South Sudan, but in East Africa, let me tell you that the single most important thing, if you had to do one thing to enhance a country, many people will tell you, and I will tell you, if you had only one thing you could do, it would be enhance girls' education. That's the single most important thing if you had to focus on one thing. The next issue, psychological trauma from the conflicts. There are no psychologists to work with the psychological trauma. There are a few people trained in social work. Next, human rights abuse of any number of types, including rape and brutalities, sometimes at the hands of a family's own children, forcibly done by militias who have those children at gunpoint. No surprise with what I've said, a lack of civic security and a lack of rule of law, poverty, and then malnutrition, also associated with the disease and the COVID issues. Can you think of anything else negative to say? I can't, I've given you a list. Every one of those things I've said 
is a problem in Sudan and particularly South Sudan. But we don't give up. We work as best we can through Rotary and other good opportunities. And so I now want to say something um, about Project Education South Sudan, which our friend Jim has already set the stage for through Golden Rotary. Um, I've been associated with this group for about 10 years uh, as a donor and also as an advisor pro bono. Also connected them often through the University of Denver where we had joint events. It's an absolutely wonderful organization. It's one of the best and most well-run, in my opinion, NGOs that relate to either Sudan or South Sudan that I've encountered. As of February, and again, I might be repeating some things that Jim has, has told you about, but that's fine. As of February, Project Education South Sudan, or PESS, had 56 girls enrolled, mainly high school girls, in its programming, mainly in the area of Bor, B-O-R, which is a town area in South Sudan. They focus on primarily that one town and its environs. They don't try to work all over the country. That would be too difficult. In a country of 12 million, 3 million of those people are internally displaced, not to mention refugees in neighboring countries like Uganda and Ethiopia. These 56 girls are enrolled in private schools, not in the public schools I mentioned before that are about to open up again. It's because Project Education South Sudan has found that the private schools you can count on them better. They can be more consistent in delivering education and could better administer the scholarships, if we could call them scholarships, that folks like my club, Denver Southeast, or your club, Golden, might offer the girls. All was in the amount of about $1,100 each per year. That's what it costs to help run PESS and to enable a girl to go through a year of school successfully. Now, this, they had to shut down in April because of COVID, but they hope to start again in the near future. Uh, they work on three three-month terms annually in school. Um, in addition to the basic classroom work, they also support group and team dynamics, and by that they mean dynamic training for the girls to give them a chance to become leaders in the communities after they graduate. And of course, some girls, a few, are able to go to university or college. There are universities, such as the University of Juba in South Sudan. I finished, visited Juba, it's the capital, and uh, there are two universities there. They also work through PESS on entrepreneurship, computer classes, other ways that will enable the girls who are in the program to continue on and to get good jobs. Um, I'm now gonna conclude, so we'll have plenty of time for questions and please hit me with any question that you have with two more show and tell items. This is the latest book I've come across on South Sudan. I'll tell you the name and I'll send it to our friend Jim so he'll have a record of it after this meeting. This book is called Daring to Overcome by Ioannis Kang Lawal. I've just met Ioannis two weeks ago. He's now a refugee and has been for some time living in Denver. And he himself, no surprise, is working to help the folks back home, in his case in Southeast South Sudan. There's his book. Daring to Overcome. And the final artifact for show and tell is this cane. You can see this nice hardwood cane with a very nice handle on it. I was given this by two lost boys. You guys have all heard about the lost boys and the lost girls of Sudan. I was given this when I was there in thanks for my help. Well, it was a great honor. They say they only give this to elders. Well, I'm an elder, so I was honored to receive this, but that's not the point of my story. The point of my story is, 
If you receive a gift like this in Sudan or South Sudan, it's an obligation. And Jim was asking about our theory of obligation. This engenders an obligation. If you accept this gift, you must help the people who gave it to you. You don't have an option. If you have the resources, which I do, if you have some talent, which I hope I do, and you can work with people, not at people, but with people, you must continue throughout your life to help the people who gave you this cane. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as you uh, as you noted, you left some time for some questions, so I'd like to uh, open it up to the room first. If anybody has any questions or comments for Peter, it's a quiet group here at the Origin Hotel. Uh, how about our? Oh, excuse me, uh, Paul. Um, what the heck was that? Uh, Peter, you showed a picture of a, uh, a mountain and you had a yes. specific name for it. Um, I believe it was Jebel Mera, in, uh, and that was in the Darfur region of Western Sudan. <laughs> uh, Jamie would like you to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in English, in English, it would be uh, J E B E L. M E R A. Very good. So Paul wanted to know, Jamie wanted to know how to spell it, and I think uh, Pat wants to know how to climb it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a very uh, attractive mountain, as you noticed. It's, uh, it's volcanic. Uh, it's a variation of a volcanic dike. It's only about 300 feet tall, but it's quite, uh, it's quite pleasant. Uh, any any questions from our uh, TV guest, uh, Jim? Uh, yes, Peter, I wonder if you could address another issue. I'm aware of in the 1700s, there were five to 10,000 tribes in the world, depending on which anthropologist you speak with. In the 1800s, uh, European countries began colonizing, attempting to bring everybody together. Uh, in the 1900s, they all dispersed. So by the mid 1900s, a lot of the African nations now are back to multiple tribes attempting to congeal. Um, how many tribes are, is, is that an issue in South Sudan? Yes, that's a very good question, Jim. Thanks for asking. Yep, um, tribalism uh, on the positive side, being respectful to your tribe, identifying with your tribe, promoting the customs of your tribe. All those are positive things, of course. Um, there are over 20 well-identified tribes, perhaps close to 30, Jim, just in South Sudan, just in South Sudan. Let me name three that are the most famous and the most achieved and also the most problematic. And those three are the New Air, the Dinka, and the Shilluk. And there are others. I'm just naming those three because those are the three that I've worked with most often, people from those tribes. Great leaders from those tribes who stand out. I could mention Pagan Amum Okiech. He's a Shilluk tribesman who has taken a lead in the peace talks for his entire country of South Sudan. He's a friend of mine by good coincidence. He spends part of his time in Denver and part of his time in South Sudan. And he's tearing what little hair that he has left out of his head as he tries to bring people together. The tribalism, Jim, is almost impossible to overcome the negativities of tribalism, given the other resource problems I mentioned. Not unlike what we're going through. Well, there are some parallels. Divisiveness. Uh, any other uh, questions from our group? Uh, Colleen. 
Yes, I would like to know um, within the tribes, uh, how are women treated or is that, uh, is, is that very similar to, the, to uh, just the regular uh, Christianity and Muslim within the country? Oh, that's a very good question, Colleen. Um, no surprise, males are dominant in the politics and males are dominant in most of the decision making. Um, in some cases, I'm sad to say women are not treated well with the militias that have come in, including in South Sudan, the quasi-military on either side, quasi-military militias, often when they come to a village, no surprise, sadly, the women are the first people they encounter, the first people they abuse. Um, do women have leadership roles? Yes, some do. And that's what's so good about Project Education South Sudan because those young women going through high school, several of our, about half a dozen of them have already become local leaders. It's unusual, but that's exciting. That's why we're hoping Golden, along with the other Rotary Clubs, will further get behind this, which I know you're doing. So thank you. But overall, I have to say, Colleen, the situation is not always, but often oppressive for women. Very good. Um, let's see, uh, Russ, here in, in uh, is the room. Is the uh, government a, a democracy, or how would you describe it? The, the question was uh, regarding the, the government in Sudan. Is it a democracy, or how would you describe the government? I would describe government? it. I'm sorry to say they're shooting for a democracy. Ever since independence in 2011, I saw people lined up at the voting station to vote for their independence in 2011, which is when I happened to be there, they told me, we're gonna have a democracy here. I said, boy, I hope so. They haven't gotten there yet. It's, I would have to call it under the current president, his name is Salva Kiir, K-I-I-R. He always wears a big cowboy hat and cowboy boots to show a great aura of personality. He's a big man, I'll tell you, he's not a democratic man. He's an autocrat. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you could see this uh, question from Mick uh, in the chat. No, please don't read it to me, I can't see it. Uh, what are the main agendas or belief differences between the two sides of the most recent civil war? Oh, that's a very tough question, that's a good question. Uh, one is broadly, who should be in power? Should it be a shared agreement among multiple tribal leaders and groups, particularly among the two most powerful, the New Air and the Dinka? So a, a belief we'll say is for power sharing, or at the other extreme, you can guess, should it be a comp competition? And I don't mean like, like Republicans and Democrats, I mean like one tribe and another having a balance of power in some way, which I have to tell you is not working well, despite their talk in that direction, either a balance or a sharing, neither of them is working well because the selfishness of the leaders is reigning supreme. So if a political belief about that is, <laughs> is problematic, now, a second different kind of belief that I'd like to mention, since that was a very good question, is around resources. I mentioned oil. Yep, oil's a big deal. But traditional resources are based on cattle. Many of these people are cattle herders and cattle owners. And as one man said, I've never forgotten it, a cow is like a person. What he meant was, he realizes it's not a person, of course. He means in that culture, a cow can be as important as a person when you're dealing with resources. That's an intriguing belief. Um, as, as we wrap up, uh, Peter, thank you. Um, reminds me of a, a, a quote, uh, a rotary, uh, theme quote that I'm probably going to get a little wrong, but it's uh, 
uh, because the world never sets on Rotary, uh, Rotary can do a world of good. So uh, hearing about project education is, is certainly encouraging. So thanks so uh, much. Yeah, thank you for uh, joining with us.